I, so I'm going to talk to you for, well, for, for about 50, 55 minutes uh, around this agenda as, as part of a series of three. But can I just say, I, I guess everything that I say, I say with sort of humility. Um, I'm you know, working in addressing these issues in school at the moment. It's challenging. Well, it's always been challenging, but it just got more challenging uh, as a result of a sort of global uh, a, a global pandemic. And um, I guess I, I, I don't think I'm better at any anyone anyone at anything. But I guess I have the privilege of working with schools across the country, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 seeing schools' efforts to address disadvantage in lots of different contexts. I'll define what I mean by disadvantage as we go through the the, the, the presentation. Um, but I, I, I guess I have the privilege of working with lots of schools and what I try to do in all of this work, uh, in publications, in, uh, in the studies that we've done, is to provide, to codify an approach to addressing disadvantage that's not the same in every school, but what are the sort of underlying principles that we need uh, to, 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 to adopt. Um, schools can't solve all of society's problems and neither should we uh, try to. Um, um, but we're not powerless on this agenda either, and there are some things that we can do strategically and indeed operationally that really can make a difference for our disadvantaged and vulnerable uh, le le learners. And I'm going to talk about these, you know, as part of a, uh, a, a, a logic model. Um, you know, some principles around how we develop uh, an effective strategy for supporting disadvantaged and vulnerable uh, le learners. You know, and I'm going to talk about each of these strands in turn around securing the highest of expectations uh, for all of our pupils, irrespective of background and barrier to, to or barrier to learning. The importance of strong relationships uh, that we address sort of school culture defining high expectations. Um, um, that assessment, not assumptions, uh, should drive our approach and that uh, we should be driven by learning, uh, not labels. Um, there's no such thing, uh, uh, well, there are no homogenous groups uh, here. Um, and, uh, uh, and uh, an assessment uh, of need is of fundamental uh, in, in importance. One of the biggest barriers to the achievement of a disadvantaged pupils, I'd argue, is assessments, uh, is, is assumptions around uh, their, their, their needs. Uh, when we've done that assessment of need, we think about how we can use the tiered model, the EF's tiered model around uh, teaching and learning, uh, academic intervention and wider uh, 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 approaches but also um, thinking about the evidence base that supports that uh, approach and be using research evidence to challenge our thinking, be using research evidence to challenge our assumptions about what we might do. We need to think carefully about implement, uh, implementation and, 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 and how we draw on uh, system-wide support and, and, and expertise. I'd argue we can't solve these challenges instead of in, 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 in isolation, and that might be about informal system-wide support, blogs, social media, websites, those kinds of things, or more targeted uh, support like send reviews, uh, people bring reviews, and, 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 and then thinking carefully about uh, impact evaluation uh, too. Before I uh, sort of leap into all, all, all of this and start talking to you in, 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 in earnest. Um, I, I think it's always worth saying that you know, children, pupils, students, you know, are not at risk uh, of underachievement uh, because um, their pupil premium um, or indeed any other label that children might uh, come with, uh, children at risk of underachievement because of the impact of disadvantage on their learning over time. And I will come to disadvantage and defining it in a, in, 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 in a short while. But it's not because of a label that pupils are at risk of underachievement. It's because of the impact of disadvantage on their learning over time. And that is a process, uh, not an event. It's something that help impact. Uh, it's something that starts in many cases prenatal. It's a long-term issue that warrants a long-term uh, ter uh, re re response. Um, and teaching and learning, inclusive teaching and learning, remains our best lever for, 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 for addressing it. Um, uh, so, so, so we need a learning-led uh, strategy rather than a label-led strategy. Uh, and I'm going to keep that as a, 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 a focus right the way through my talk. Before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about sort of school culture and expectations. 
and a collective responsibility for supporting uh, the needs of our disadvantaged pupils. I think there's an increasingly you know, um, an, a, an awareness in our education system that you know, um, uh, eligibility for pupil premium of a six you know, is, is one measure you know, of, uh, of, um, uh, of disadvantage, but it's actually a pretty poor proxy uh, for, for, for disadvantage. And there are lots of complexities uh, with, within it. I'll talk about that in, in, in a moment. But in the work that we did, it's a bit Gilroy Lockhart, this isn't it, sharing your own work as, as, as part of a presentation. So forgive me for, for, for that. But um, the work we did in, in, in Essex, colleagues there were really, really keen to move away from, you know, um, a pupil premium strategy, a label-led strategy, and move towards this. So that so it's moving away from the question, what are the needs of our pupil premium children, and to be thinking more about how does disadvantage impact on pupils' learning. So then we in, we, we we include you know, a far wider group than that narrow definition of, di of, uh, of of disadvantage, because what colleagues in Essex and indeed I think colleagues you know in in um, in the DfE are really keen to do now, um, because it's the right thing to do <laughs> in terms of research evidence, but also sort of morally, is that what we don't want in schools is an inclusion strategy, an EAL strategy, a SEND strategy, a disadvantage strategy, a catch-up strategy, on all these different things running in the, sort of lots of different directions, but rather we need to be thinking much more broadly around a sort of disadvantage and vulnerability in children at risk of, of, of underachievement. So we need to be thinking you know, about uh, the needs of our pupils first uh, and, and to be driven by their, their, their learning needs. I also want to reference this work we did in the opportunity areas in Oldham and Derby a couple of years ago now, um, because I think this is really important to the discussions too. So what we found in Oldham and Derby, the opportunity areas there, um, that in, in terms of addressing educational disadvantage, there was very little difference uh, between schools that were performing well and those that were struggling in terms of the activities that they adopted to try and address educational disadvantage in all of its uh, sort of forms. Um, the thing that defined uh, the schools that were struggling um, was one or two people being uh, responsible for disadvantaged and vulnerable pupils. Um, and uh, the leadership of that work being passed around uh, the school uh, senior leadership team like the baton in the 100 meter relay race and as you can see uh, from my rather daft image uh, here sometimes those batons sort of get Get, get, get dropped. Um, leadership of disadvantage being passed around the school like past the pass in an infant uh, party. Um, and, and, and so there was a lack of consistency of approach and things not being implemented uh, well. Um, the thing that also defined uh, those schools that were struggling were multiple senior leaders over a short space of time and a real sense of initiative fatigue. So whenever anyone new came into the ro ro role, September inset, I'd better launch something but the launch and prey uh, uh, approach. So it wasn't the activity that actually was problematic. It was often trying to do too many things uh, at once, but about them not being implemented uh, well either. So in schools, I'd argue, and this is based on, you know, I guess about sort of 30 area-based uh, studies looking at education disadvantage, but also working with over 650 schools, that schools that perform well by their disadvantaged and vulnerable pupils are those, you know, that have a collective understanding of how disadvantage impacts on pupils' learning. They have a collective understanding of how the school is looking to address that, and we do a few things well. Teacher autonomy and teacher agency at the heart of the, of, uh, 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 of the approach, so that individuals in the school community understanding what their role is uh, w within it. So schools that are most effective at addressing disadvantage give teachers and in support staff, academic and pastoral, the capacity, the professional development, the expertise, the knowledge, uh, the support to be able to meet the needs of their pupils in their school uh, c c community. Um, so that collective responsibility rather than the individual responsibility is a critical sort of active in, 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 in ingredient. Um, around school culture, I, I just want to say a little bit about sort of high, high expectations. Um, um, it's really, really important that, you know, that, that, that we secure high expectations um, 
four out of disadvantaged vulnerable pupils across school. But we define what we mean by that. It's difficult to imagine, isn't it, going into any school and colleagues saying, well, you know, we, 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 we've got low expectations of our vulnerable pupils, but sometimes we, we, you know, we do hear you know, some um, uh, some low expectations and we do see, see some low expectations as well. At a school level, I think there's something really important about, you know, sort of what I call curriculum equity. And what I mean by that is that if we're not careful, uh, 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 our, uh, our most disadvantaged pupils, our most vulnerable pupils, particularly those that are low prior attainers, having a... Uh, uh, a narrower curriculum entitlement uh, than their uh, than their higher attaining peers, um, and that can often doubly disadvantage pupils. We can have the Matthew effect in action. So those pupils that have the broadest vistas outside of school, the richest experiences, yeah, um, outside of school, can often have the widest, uh, the broadest uh, curriculum experiences, sort of in in, in school. Um, and that's the Matthew effect sort of in, in, in action. Also, in you know, perhaps more of a, you know, a, a secondary issue, but can affect primary as well, is the this sort of um, the, the Matthew effect in terms of who is teaching our disadvantaged and vulnerable pupils. Again, who are the, the, the lower attaining pupils? Um, what we found in a number of different contexts is that you know, the lowest attaining pupils often far more likely to be working with non-subject specialists or, or, or non-permanent members of staff compared to their higher attaining peers. And again, we've got the Matthew uh, sort of effect in, 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 in action there. Also then perhaps, and that's a, perhaps a macro sort of level, but a more micro uh, level, high expectations around what we expect in, in, in our classrooms, the importance of scaffolding up rather than differentiating down giving pupils less work, easier work, um, focusing on task completion is going to widen the gap, not expecting all pupils uh, to speak in four sentences, uh, accepting one word answers, those, uh, th those kinds of things, or indeed when we have talk partners you know, in the classroom and some pupils are marginalized uh, from that, all of those things you know, lead to lower expectations of pupils. I'd also want to challenge language around low ability children. I think it's really, really uh, sort of problematic. And uh, Ofsted still use that type of uh, la la language in their inspection reports. And what Professor Steve Higgins, Durham University argues is that when we label pupils sort of low ability, it can create a subconscious bias around what we might expect of those uh, children over time. Let's say it's Mark, he's low ability, he doesn't read very much at home. We might expect me to contribute a little bit less in class discussions. We might be, expect me to write a little bit less and over time that can set uh, sort of limits on what pupils uh, can achieve. My colleagues at Edith Borthwick Special School sum it up brilliantly, I think, in this, you know, it, it, you know, in, in, in this code that actually, you know, differentiating down and giving pupils easier work is a far more dangerous assumption uh, around what pupils can do than scaffolding up, providing work examples, partially work examples, modeling, 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 you know, pre-teach to enable access uh, to, to, to the learning. So there's some stuff about expectations at school level and then at a, 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 at a classroom level too. And we don't address educational disadvantage by big shiny interventions with folders. It's about every moment uh, being an important interaction uh, with, uh, with, 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 with our disadvantaged pupils. Um, it's what happens in the classroom that will make the biggest difference. So um, just some reflection points. I'm not going to talk to all of these uh, uh, because we don't have three hours, uh, um, but uh, uh, hopefully these rather text heavy slides um, will be useful for you as a takeaway uh, and, and a series of reflection uh, points rather than things that we're going to talk about in, 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 in this session. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's important as this is a series of sessions, they'll lead you into session uh, sort of one and session two, some intersessional sort of re 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 reflections. So I've talked about the importance of system-wide knowledge and understanding about how best to address educational disadvantage is key that we define, uh, we have a definable school culture. We know, don't we, when school culture is right, you can almost touch it in terms of everybody taking responsibility and ownership of disadvantaged vulnerable pupils. Um, strong and sustained uh, re 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 relationships. I'm generalizing here, so forgive me, but that consistent relationship of fundamental uh, sort of Im 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 importance. I've talked about high uh, 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 expectations. Mm -hmm. 
and that you know and, and and relationships expectations are sometimes about having challenging conversations as well as the the the, 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 you know, the, 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 the easy uh, ones i really want to emphasize this point about reflective rather than defensive uh, leadership and again i say this with humility i understand that it's hard particularly in the last sort of year year, year and a half but actually you know in terms of our self evaluations erica is talking about uh, um you know send reviews that when we're self-evaluating, it needs to be genuinely, could we do better uh, by our more vulnerable pupils? Not because what we're doing is not good enough to misquote Dylan William, but actually that we can always get better at these uh, things. And our self-evaluation needs to be genuinely uh, 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 reflective, not mirror, mirror on the wall. Um, because I'd argue that the schools that are highest performing around their most uh, vulnerable pupils, you are always um you know uh, sort of re re restless sort of to get to, to get better a belief that disadvantaged pupils and vulnerable pupils can attain well isn't enough on its own but it's certainly an important ingredient and then actually you know do we believe that our all of our pupils you know can do better to to to, to, to quote uh, margaret Mulholland, i'm going to do a lot uh, through this uh, session that we be expected to be surprised by pupil uh, p potential. Um, that um, pastoral care you know, is a fundamental importance, a starting point, but actually you know, it's attainment in the classroom, it's achievement in the classroom that builds self-esteem, it broadens horizons and, 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 and that we're outward facing, keen to learn from others. And of course, that's what everybody is doing here uh, today. Anyway, okay. Um, I talked about uh, re relationships briefly, but, our efforts to addressing uh, educational disadvantage will stand or fall on the relationships that we forge. Um, I, 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 I wish I'd written this re research. I wish these words were mine. Sadly, they're not, and I can't st steal them. But I think this beautifully sums up, um, you, know, uh, um, you know, the importance of relationships for all pupils, but particularly uh, for our more vulnerable, our more disadvantaged uh, pupils. When I talk about relationships here, I talk about the relationships between adults and pupils, of course. Um, uh, the relationship between pupils and pupils and the importance of social uh, sort of interaction around relationships between adults and adults and how we work together in our schools, but also across our schools uh, as well. And ultimately, we want our disadvantage, we want our vulnerable pupils to have a better relationship with learning. Uh, you know, and this can be things like trauma perceptive practice to just you know, informal conversations, you know, in, you know, in, 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 in the classroom and, and you know, that, that, that sense of inclusion, um, re relationships fundamental to inclusion uh, for me. So um, I've talked a lot about sort of disadvantage and, 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 and vulnerability, and it's really, really complex. It's something different in every school community, and it's not for me uh, to define. By the way, uh, I, I did try and put another circle in the Venn diagram here around other, um, but I didn't have the ICT skills. I didn't have Francesca skills to, to put it in there and the whole thing went to pot, so forgive, for, forgive me. Um, but there's no such thing if, you know, as a typically disadvantaged child, there's no such thing as a pupil premium child, there's no such thing as a SEND child, there's no such thing as an EEL child. Every one of our pupils is an individual in their own right, which is why we need to be driven by the learning needs uh, uh, of pupils rather than the labels uh, that, they, that, 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 they come, uh, that they come with. Schools are best, uh, best place uh, to define what disadvantage uh, means in their own school community. And I think the pandemic has, if it's done anything, has rather, rather helpfully shone a light on, you know, disadvantage is more complex than simplistic uh, labels. So when I talk about disadvantage, when I talk about vulnerability, I want to argue really, really strongly that means something different, you know, in, 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 in every school community, every school sort of classroom. So what we need to do, again, to quote wonderful, wonderful Margaret, I'm sure you're sort of all, all, all familiar with. Margaret's got this wonderful slide. I don't know if you've seen it, but you know, that includes pretty much every label uh, that you might come across uh, in, in, in the education system and how overwhelming that must feel for, I was going to say early career teachers, just but for more experienced teachers and leaders too. 
and what Margaret argues really, really strongly is that, you know, rather than trying to be expert in all these different labels, what we need to do you know, is be expert in the pupils in front of us. And I think that's, you know, rather than overwhelming, that's empowering, isn't it, around uh, what we do. Um, I want to do that for all of my pupils in, in, in my classroom and, you know, teaching here, I, I, don't mean, I want to be positive here because I think it's just the most wonderful thing, but it's hard enough on its own, isn't it? D doing these things well and getting to know your pupils really, really well without having to fill our heads with lots of stuff that maybe, you know, related to labels and actually you know, it takes away from our time around getting to know uh, your pupils really, really well. For example, I think we need to put the pupil premium monster back in its box. Yeah, because actually so much has been driven by, can you name all your pupil premium children in your class? Um, that taking up time rather than, you know, do I really, really know my pupils well? Do I know what their strengths are? You know, um, do I need know how to make them tick? Do I know, you know their, ab about their background knowledge? Do I know about where they might struggle with their oral language? And, 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 and focusing on the things that are, that are preventing children from attaining as well uh, as, as, as they could do. It's not the label that pre is preventing children from attaining as well as they could do. It's much more complex you know, th th than that. So understanding pupil need is of fundamental importance to addressing uh, di disadvantage. Poorly identified pupil need leads to poorly identified activity, leads to weaker outcomes for pupils, leads to initiative fatigue, uh, and, and, and it leads to the supermarket sweep approach to addressing disadvantage where I'm trying to grab hold of different interventions, upper key stage two, upper key stage four, to try and pull children up to meet the sort of accountability targets. Being expert in our pupils, you know, through rigorous diagnostic assessment, academic and pastoral, listening to pupils about their learning, um, observing their learning behaviours in the classroom, listening to them read, you know, enables us to be expert in our pupils and it enables us to intervene early to enable pupils to thrive uh, in, in, in school. The earlier that we intervene, the better the chances we have uh, 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 of success. So we need, you know, what Margaret would call you know, a pupil-led strategy, pupil-led approach rather than the provision-led uh, uh, approach. This is not about, we've got this resource, you have to fit into it, but rather, you know, um, you know a, 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 an approach being driven by pupil need uh, in, the, in, in, in the classroom. So understanding need, assessment, not assumptions uh, should drive our, our approach. And I, my colleagues at Doncaster Research School have produced this super um, uh, web uh, resource around uh, useful diagnostic uh, assessments that you might find useful in the link uh, there be driven by, you know, it's, it's a learning-led strategy rather than a learning-led uh, approach. That we understand um, how disadvantage uh, presents and how it impacts on the pupils. And we can see that we've got colleagues from across the country, that, you know, today from South London, you know, to, 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 to rural communities. It's not easier or more difficult to address disadvantage in those communities. It's just different. So we need to understand disadvantage in those, uh, the, 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 those communities. I think, Give me this rather cryptic reference in the second bullet bullet point. I think um, accountability for pupil premium uh, and its place on the performance tables is on balance a good thing, uh, despite all the problems it solves. I know that's not not everyone will agree with me on, a, on that, and I think that's uh, okay. But I've worked in a number of education systems where there isn't transparency of data and transparency of outcomes. Um, and where that's been the case, I, I, I think the people that affect the most are children from disadvantaged backgrounds, where that where, where those outcomes are sort of are, 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 are hidden away. So it's not a good thing, as I say in the slide, but it's better than not having it there at all. <laughs> if what I'm saying is not getting a, a, a bit too muddled. Um, um, thinking about how to, you know, in terms of understanding people need, how we use data well. Um, I have uh, an emotional reaction to chronological reading age uh, tests because all they tell us about what pupils' current reading age is, they're pretty blunt, they're a bit in inaccurate, and they don't really tell us 
um, why children are struggling, uh, perhaps potentially with, with, with reading. They don't tell us um, about, you know, is it word recognition? Is it language comprehension? Is it background knowledge? Is it, voc is it vocabulary? Is it something uh, else? And, the, you know, and there are some formal and informal diagnostic assessments that we can use. The Doncaster Research School page has some of those, but also, you know, they're no substitute for taking the time to watching and listening to children read and, and hearing and them talking about, you know, that, 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 that reading. Also that we use data well for things like impact evaluation too. So critically, we focus on, you know, to address disadvantage, the causes of underachievement, not the symptoms. So there may be issues around attendance, but actually that might be to do with relationships. It might be about uh, self-esteem, self-confidence, social measure, mental health. It might be about literacy. You know, uh, it may be about all of those things and attendance uh, may be the symptom of it. But what's critical is that we focus on the controllable factors that are preventing our pupils from attaining as well as they might do. And the reason I talk about attainment deliberately is that uh, attainment gives us choice, uh, an opportunity. You know, whether we like it or not, it opens. Yeah, it it, it opens doors uh, to, to 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 opportunity. And our disadvantaged pupils don't lack talent or, or or ability, but sometimes they can lack opportunity. And I really want to emphasise this point about focusing on the controllable factors. So what I want to argue here is that you know um, we have far more control over the quality of the reading instruction or the language, the oral language uh, strategies that we develop in our classrooms than we do how we can influence some of the things that happen outside of school. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't try and influence the latter, but we need to focus on the controllable factors, the most controllable factors first, and that is the quality of the learning experience and how well children are included in learning you know, in, in, in the classroom in our schools. Okay, so um, Erica, I know, I'm just checking that I need to get I need to get on with it. Oh, die, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, the the the, the language talking about controllable factors here. Um, you know, the, the, the the language gap for me is the attainment gap, coupled with issues around social sort of isolation. This is a seminal study, Walvogel and Washbrook, uh, low income and early cognitive development that I thoroughly commend uh, to, to 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 all of you, and like multiple studies picking out the sort of correlation between. You know, um, growing up in lo lo low income uh, groups and difficulties with language. The language gap is the attainment uh, sort of ga ga gap and how it can influence and impact other areas as, uh, as well. And I argue that one of the greatest challenges for our disadvantaged and vulnerable pupils in our schools is what I call the presumption of language, the presumption of background knowledge. Language comprehension for me is the closest thing that we've got to a golden ticket you know, on, on, on this agenda. And when I struggle with language comprehension, my lessons become something to get through uh, rather than participate in. I'm sort of clinging on to the lesson rather than deeply participating uh, in, in, in it. In particular, children's oral language, underdeveloped oral language is a significant anchor uh, on, 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 future, uh, on future attainment. As I say, if we can get this right, we give pretty much everything else that we do in our education system a better chance of, of success. It can lead to higher self-esteem, better self-confidence, better attention, better contributions in class, a better sense of, you know, of belonging. Um, you know, when I struggle with language comprehension, you know, I, I might engage in some you know, desktop truancy, just keeping my head down, you know, get, 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 get through the lessons, really, rather than sort of really feel like I belong and a sense of belonging uh, for our more vulnerable pupils, for me, is, is, is of fundamental uh, importance. We can't tackle this with an intervention. As good as the Nuffield Early Language Intervention LE might be, it's only as good as what happens in the classroom around, uh, 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 around uh, those, uh, those things. So it needs to be that every moment uh, in school is a language uh, development sort of o o o opportunity. Um, uh, we need to immerse, I think, our, our, our children in a tsunami of language, you know, and, it, and it's not just sort of word exposure. We need to really understand, you know, that it's multiple child friendly interactions with new language uh, that, that, that help us develop uh, that, that, uh, a vocabulary in our language, meaningful interactions with new uh, language, you know, which builds you know, sort of cultural capital. It, build self-confidence. You know, comprehension is a 
gateway to, to, to better, better confidence and, and a sense of belonging in the classroom. So, so some linked research, which I share with you with, with a bit of trepidation. This is Hart and Risley, the early uh, sort of catastrophe. And um, uh, I, I share with trepidation because there's a lot of extrapolation in this sort of research. But again, it's picking out um, this well-documented language gap. The thing that I think is really interesting here is the points uh, that Hart and Risley make about the types of language that pupils uh, hear as, uh, as well. So it's not about just um, the... Um, the the, the amount of language that children from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds hear, but the types too. So they pick out, the researchers pick out that, you know, children from more affluent backgrounds more likely to hear words of praise and encouragement as opposed to um, those from more disadvantaged backgrounds. And as Hart and Risley say, this is not about a level, a lack of level of care or anything like, like that. We need to be really careful, um, but rather, you're poor, you're restricted, aren't you? You can do fewer things and children might be hearing things like stop, don't, can't, because actually you know, um, you know, o o opportunity and freedom might be about growing up in less safe communities. We've been working up in Stoke-on-Trent over the last few months, talking to children in primary schools about what they do in the evenings and the weekends and comments like, we can't go to the park because it's unsafe. You know, that, 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 that's a sort of, I guess, a practical illustration you know, of the restrictions with, uh, you know, on, on, on your life when you're sort of growing up uh, poor. But it may be, you know, and, and, and I want to emphasize the may here, why, you know, again, children from poorer backgrounds may be more reluctant, you know, to, 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 to take risks, particularly in the early years and try, and, and, and try new things out. Which is why it comes back to Margaret's point around, the importance of being expected to be surprised by pupils and that they can do more than they've previously done. So thinking about how we address disadvantage in the classroom strand uh, C, that we use evidence to inform our decision uh, making. I'll talk about evidence, you know, sort of in, 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 a bit more in a moment that we develop uh, our staff to ensure that they can meet the needs of pupils, but both academically and pastorally. We need experts in those uh, roles. Um, I really want to challenge this notion of quality first uh, teaching, which is so broad that it's, uh, it's almost meaningless, uh, isn't it? Particularly when we're thinking about our disadvantaged and vulnerable pupils. I think it's just too simplistic to say it's just quality first teaching and what we need to be thinking about is how do we develop our teaching and learning staff so they can meet the needs of our disadvantaged and vulnerable pupils in the classroom. Um, quality first teaching is just not specific enough and the development of our teaching staff needs to be focused on those controllable factors that are preventing our children from attaining as well as, as they could do. Everything that we do on this agenda stands or falls on how well we teach children to read. Pretty much, you know, it's absolutely critical. Uh, I've talked about the importance of reading comprehension a little bit sort of uh, earlier. I'm not shying away from trying to assess those things that are really important, uh, in particular children's oral language, you know, that, you know, that can't just um, you know, presume that because we're working on children's language in the classroom that that's, uh, that, that's improving. So a relentless focus on language uh, acquisition, language comprehension, um, as I've said uh, before, um, associated with self-esteem, self-confidence, self-regulation skills. Um, I remember talking to a pupil uh, up in a secondary school in York, I'll call her Francesca for the purpose of this talk, talk who said, you know, I asked, I asked her, you know, Francesca, what do you do when you find uh, your learning really, really difficult? Um, uh, what do you do when you find you get stuck? And Francesca looked me in the eye and said, I cause an argument and I get kicked out of the lesson. You know, you know no emotion in it, it a really clear strategy to avoid. You know, so, uh, and this was about, you know, um, you know, not having the background knowledge, the language to be able to access you know, the, 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 the learning. I think we need to be really, and I, I, and I, I do get a little bit emotional, but so, so, so forgive me, this notion that some subjects or some areas of learning are better for children who are vulnerable and, mis and, 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 and disadvantaged. I think that's inherently problematic and sending some children on a particular sort of pathway. You know, it may be that there are particular subject areas that are suitable for individual children, should, but it should certainly not be predetermined by a particular label or indeed their prior attainment uh, profile. Um, you know, 
because often it may be just that they haven't learned those things you know, as much or, or already or found them sort of you know, it, 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 it historically difficult. So prior attainment should not put an anchor on future attainment or indeed sort of opportunity. Really important that you know schools have so little time, don't they? Everybody is really, really busy. So we must, must, must focus on those things that have the biggest effect sizes. So for example, reading comprehension strategies are going to have a bigger effect size than something like mentoring. That's not to say that mentoring isn't a useful thing to do, um, but it needs to supplement those things that will make the biggest difference uh, for our, um, uh, our disadvantaged and vulnerable pupils. And this final point around uh, performance over learning, Robert Bjork and, 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 and colleagues work over this, that we need to be really, really wary, don't we, of sort of poor proxies uh, for learning. Robert Coe has talked about this as well, just because pupils are quiet and busy in class. Uh, um, you know, uh, I've talked about desktop truancy already, doesn't mean, not mean that they're particularly participating in learning. Answers in pupils' books you know, can be a pretty poor proxy for learning particularly if they've got some, you know, uh, what Rob Webster calls, you know, some well-intentioned but problematic uh, TA support. Rob talks about sometimes the snowplow TA, you know, that will remove any difficulty that the child is, you know, is, is facing and fill out the answers uh, for them. It's well-intentioned, but really, really problematic. So we need, you know, a shared understanding of learning you know, in, 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 in our schools. So I've talked a lot about reading and I'm going to get on, I'm going to get on with it, but I, I just wanted to pick out this re research from the Millennium Cohort Study, University College London about reading. I've laboured the point uh, about reading and why we need to go beyond uh, the headlines you know, in, in, in research. So we, um, this uh, study tells us, least surprising thing you hear this year, that children who read more have a better vocabulary than those uh, that, 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 that don't. Even um, children who read more from lower socioeconomic groups, who read more, do better in vocabulary test scores than their peers. But the whole notion of reading for pleasure here is fundamentally uh, sort of problematic because um, I'm unlikely to read with the frequency, breadth and depth that I need to to overcome that language gap if I haven't learned to read well. Um, I'm unlikely to read for pleasure uh, if I find reading really, really difficult. So again, this is why it's so exciting, I think, for, for, for schools. Schools really, really matter for all pupils, but they particularly matter for our disadvantaged and vulnerable pupils, because if we teach children to read really, really well, um, they can overcome that language gap associated with growing up on low incomes. It's not enough just to do stuff, reading for pleasure celebrations, carry a book in your bag. You know, um, Modelling of reading is important, but actually, you know, it, it's how well we teach children to read that really, really matters. And then I just really want to talk briefly about, uh, linked to the point about R Rob's work uh, 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 and use and impact of teaching assistance, I want to talk about self-regulated uh, learning. Tenuous links here in, in terms of my harvest mouse in, in the picture, but I think two really interesting sort of re re resources linked here. Um, this study around children, persist less uh, when adults take over. Goodness me, haven't I learned that from my youngest daughter, Martha? <laughs> she lets me do everything for her and I still, uh, let, uh, you know, anyway, anyway I'm, I'm still doing that. But also um, the metacognitive in, in, awareness inventory that allows you to uh, do some assessments of, uh, you know, of, of whether children have um, you know, metacognitive strategies when they find things learning difficult. Um, it's really interesting to do that work uh, get pupils to carry out the, 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 the survey and teachers and see if there's any gap between the two, which tells us sort of a, a, a lot in itself. But the harvest mass here is about the importance of um, using metacognitive talk in the classroom, because I think this is a fundamental importance to our disadvantaged and vulnerable pupils, particularly those that lack background uh, knowledge. So it's about, you know, not just celebrating the answers. Well, I might ask Francesca a question, I don't know, about, I, I, I don't know, coastal erosion. And, and, and Francesca might give me the answer. It's not enough for me just to say, uh, Fr Francesca, thank you. Great, now we all know about that uh, aspect of uh, coastal erosion. We have to ask Francesca how she knows uh, that. 
and perhaps she might say about the, you know, the wider reading that she's done, the TV programme that she's watched about it, the conversation she might have had with some, somebody else. So as my colleague Andy Brumby from the Cornwall Research School says, he says, don't just celebrate the harvest, the answer, but we also need to be unpicking the ploughing, the planting, the weeding, the pruning that got us to that answer. Because if we don't unpick how Francesca knew that answer, those pupils without that background knowledge think Francesca is magically clever. She just knows those uh, those things and we create an artificial divide in the classroom. So it's, again, I'd argue, it's not big shiny interventions that make the difference for uh, our, 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 our more vulnerable pupils. It's every interaction in the classroom day in, day out, a week in, week out, term in, term out. Okay, and the last one that I want to talk to you hear about is around sort of bias. Some of these slides are terrible, by the way, I know for pres presentations, but for, 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 forgive me, I really want to, uh, 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 again, make these useful for, for takers. We need to be unpicking issues around bias. But an issue around tags, hasn't it, and CAGs sort of la la last, last year. Um, unconscious, subconscious bias is something that's well documented in, in, in our education system. And one of the ways we can deal with it is by talking about it and getting it out in the open. We had some really interesting discussions with teachers in Cornwall a couple of years ago, just some informal experiments around asking people to write down what are the first things uh, they think about uh, when I say send? What are the first things you think about when I say free school meals? Colleagues were really honest about how, you know, the first things they thought about were, were low attainment. And, and, and of course, you know, there may be an association with lower attainment in those uh, the, 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 those groups uh, for things like long term disadvantage and and, and 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 more, but we need to be really wary that they don't become uh, the, the, the narrative. So bias exists in our education system. We only have to look at the work of Professor Backy Francis in her grouping study, uh, qualitative analysis of setting and grouping pupils in key stage three. Becky's study found that um, children of Black Caribbean heritage on average are set two sets lower than what their current attainment says uh, they should be. So it exists in our education system. The way we deal with it is to, is, is to talk about it. And there are lots of different types of biases. You know, teachers in Cornwall also talked about um, you know, surnames as well and biases. And there's, you know, oh no, I've got another Wakefield, another one, you know, and, and how that can create the, the narrative there. So we have you know, biases around attainment, ability labels, you know, he's low ability, Mark, he's low ability, that can set limits on people's achieve. Categorization labels, um, you, know, uh, you know, he's send and pupil premium. Um, ethnicity, white British, I heard quite recently someone being described as having a tiger mum, so they can also, you know, uh, other types of biases really around white working class, girls and maths. You know, and I'm sure you've lots of heard lots of these. Um, you know, family biases. You know, the brother really struggles; they never read at home. Um, or confident confidence bias as well around. You know, uh, Francesca never puts her hand up in class. You know, it lacks confidence. Those kinds of things it can be much more complex uh, than that, and we've got to be aware of biases creating the narrative. Bias exists, as Cannon says. Uh, Cannon says here, it's part of a human condition. It's part of a natural response to things, so we can't get rid of it. Um, but we can control for it by talking about it. Okay. So look, just to let, let, let labour the point, I'm not going to talk to this uh, slide, not least I'm running out of time, but the importance of whatever we do, that we're driven by pupil need, uh, not, not, not the labels, not least because that will mean that the approaches that we adopt will have bigger impacts on pupils, but it will also save us on workload and time and, and, and resources because our interventions will be much more targeted at pupil need. Just a couple more uh, uh, things. I, I, I want to issue, uh, address this issue around sort of parental uh, in, in involvement because parental involvement comes up all too often when we're working with uh, schools around addressing disadvantage. And I'd come back again and again to this super, super research from uh, Jill Main from the University of Leeds. Uh, I've looked at this hundreds and hundreds of times and it's still uncomfortable reading, isn't it, around um, the lack of uh, the, the, the myth of low aspirations you know, in, in, in disadvantaged and vulnerable uh, pupils, um, but also um, you know, that sometimes there are you know, other challenges and, uh, uh, and, uh, and other priorities you know, um, that, that, that families might be facing. 
and, and finally linked to that super research from the British Psychological Society around attendance, exclusion and persistent abs uh, absence that I think you'll find really, really helpful to you. I'm not going to talk to that now. Okay. <laughs> oh, so just to, to, to wrap up in the next uh, 10 minutes, so just the final um, uh, uh, strands. I'm not going to talk through all those red flags, but uh, we need to be thinking really, really carefully about how research uh, in, informs uh, the approaches that we use. There is no approved list of research uh, evidence that we should uh, be using. The key is that we are, we engage with research evidence to challenge our thinking. Again, to quote uh, sort of Rob Webster, Rob says the more research evidence he reads, the less confident he is about all his opinions. And I think that's absolutely the way we should be using evidence to challenge our thinking, not to justify it. If we use, if we're looking for research evidence to justify an approach that we want to do, we'll find it. Uh, we'll find it, but it doesn't mean that it'll be the, use, the, the, the most effective uh, approach. We need to be really, really wary of what I call EF toolkit light and a shallow engagement with research evidence um, using those sort of meta meta outcomes and the measure of uh, additional months progress and making tenuous links uh, to the activities that we want to adopt. So that's not to say that having else's is not a good thing. I think inherently it is a good thing, um, and particularly if that's the needs of, of, of pupils. But we need to be wary of making tenuous links to, you know, meta meta analysis uh, on the EF uh, web website. Um, we need to be wary of confirmation bias. We also need to be wary of publication bias in research as well. You know that studies with big effect sizes are more li likely to be published with a fanfare uh, than those that have a sort of limited impact. So be using research evidence to challenge our, our thinking and give consideration to these, uh, the, these red flags here on the right as the screen as you look at it. And then just a couple of comments uh, on, 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 on implementation plans, because good implementation, whatever we do, is fundamental to better outcomes uh, for our pupils. Um, Poor implementation almost certainly uh, likely to, uh, to, to lead to weaker uh, outcomes. And just some reflections, working with schools across the research school network uh, across the country in the last year, just picked out you know, s s some potential problems here that might be useful to be wary of. Trying to address too many problems uh, uh, at once. Um, the problem being general, uh, too general, like improve the quality of teaching. Well, no, uh, you know, uh, what is the issue within teaching? that we need uh, to, to address to enable teachers to meet the needs of pupils. Um, yeah, avoiding the launch and prey approach that I talked about a, 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 a little bit earlier. Um, and, and, and just this uh, bottom one that I just want to give re reference to, that pupil, teacher pupil interactions yeah, are likely to lead to, to better outcomes than just changes to structures. So, for example, I've been working with uh, a couple of schools that uh, are looking to address educational disadvantage by by changing the length of, of, of lessons. Now, that might be a good thing as a starting point, um, but just that change in the lesson, the length of lessons is unlikely to lead uh, to better outcomes. We need to codify what is going to be different in terms of uh, teacher pupil interactions. It might be about modelling, it might be about using metacognitive talk, it might be about developing oral language strategies, it might be about evidence-based vocabulary instruction, it might be about embe embedding formative assessment, but it's it's the teacher pupil interactions, not just interventions or structural changes that will make all the difference. And then also how do we draw on system-wide uh, support because we cannot solve this uh, on, on, on our own. How do we learn from each other? Learning from the e e excellent the excellences exists within our schools and in our classrooms. So many of our education challenges, even the most complex ones that we're talking about here, are, are, are solved in isolation, but they're hidden away. Uh, and about how we learn from each other, that we move from, and I know you don't work some work with Simon Knight, um, but, um, uh, I, and I learned this from Simon really, up at, at Frank Wise School that, you know, that we need to learn from best process, not best practice. Um, so what is the process that you went through to get to those uh, strong outcomes rather than uh, what you're doing at the moment? And I've tried to list you know, a wide range uh, 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 of in, informal and formal support that you can draw on. You know, external experts, whole school send, you know, um, you know, 
Natalie Packer, David Bartram, wonderful Margaret, I'm sure you're sort of f f familiar with. And the Wallace Darwin effect, I don't know if you know about, I haven't got time to talk to you about Alfred Wallace, but this is about Wallace and uh, Darwin both um, uh, developed their theories of evolution, um, but didn't really publish them for about 20 years. Um, uh, they developed them alongside each other um, and didn't publish them for about 20 years because they were too busy at doing other things yeah, and actually kept that knowledge uh, 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 about the origin of species hidden away for all of that uh, time. So talking to each other formally and informally and getting out your know, thinking and our shared ideas you know, is, 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 is a fundamental importance for, 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 for system-wide support. Okay, just a, a, a couple of final uh, points here. Again, this slide you know, is more about a takeaway than something I'm going to talk to uh, here, but you know, Impact evaluation is fundamental to continuous improvement and, uh, and better outcomes uh, to our disadvantaged and vulnerable pupils. Um, produce some do's and don'ts, building on our Essex uh, work, work, work here. But the key to effective imp impact evaluation is that we're trying to evaluate whether our strategies are successful, not prove that they are. If we go down the route of trying to prove what we've done has been successful, we'll find a way of doing it, but it doesn't mean that we've got better outcomes uh, for our pupils. So it's about decoupling evaluation from accountability. <coughs> and then my final point, I hope this is a, a, a useful reflection uh, tool for you. Um, did this work with, in, in the Essex uh, strategy, building on um, uh, you know, multiple, multiple discussions and, and work with Margaret Mulholland, who's ever, ever wonderful. Um, and, and we talked about you know, a maturity index here around inclusivity and a culture of inclusivity in our schools from, you can see a less mature system, uses diagnostic labels to inform strategic planning, deference to individual experts and designated staff, you know, um, sees labels and anchor and attainment to a more mature system that, as Margaret says, expects to be surprised by pupil potential. I wish that was my words again, but they're not, they're Margaret's. But, you know, um, a strength-based discourse celebrating difference and a collective responsibility and ownership of pupil groups. So I hope that's a useful takeaway uh, for you. Yeah. Um, and, and look, ultimately, this is about people, isn't it? I've created a lot of research and talked about research evidence and programmes and approaches. But you know, and schools can't solve all, all, all of society's problems, but, but there are some things that we can do and there are things that we really can do to make a difference to, 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 to people's. We'll never have a better focus on this, I think, you know, a greater focus on this than we do at the, at the, at the, at the moment. And ultimately, I think this is a, a people business, you know, and, and, and it's people that, 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 that matter. Um, you know, so what we all do as individuals, as part of a collective, it, it is the thing that will make the difference for those people. Thank you. And if you haven't heard enough in the last hour, then there, there, there's contact details and, and, and things there. So, okay, I'll shut up. Mark, thank you so much for that. Um, I'll just start my video. Thank you so much. I have so many takeaways. Um, I think the key messages are, that I'm taking with me are a whole school approach. Um, in terms of thinking about our implementation plans, we need to select a few things to do well. Um, at this time of year in schools, we're often reflecting on where we are. So we need to be open and honest and robust in that re reflection. Um, that, but with a good implementation plan, what we really need is to be expect to be surprised by pupil potential. And those words certainly resonate with me this afternoon. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Erica. And just to say, I know we're under time, but those things like having a whole school approach, evaluating, well, everybody taking ownership, they're hard to do. It's easy to say, isn't it? Like, have a good relationship. It's a really easy thing to say from the comfort of your chair. But the reality is schools are more complex, aren't they? You know, a whole school ownership sounds really nice, but actually it's hard, isn't it? Absolutely, it is.
And I think if it was easy, we'd all be doing it. But I think it's something that we can really take away. There are so many key points in your presentation and in the messages that you've given us this afternoon that we can definitely use to inform our planning for the next 12 months. Thank you very much indeed. Now, as I've said, this is the first in a series of, of what, what webinars. So our second, we're fortunate to have two schools who Mark has already worked with to provide case studies on how they've implemented the strategies. I also want to say a big thank you to Francesca because as Mark has been speaking, she has been furiously including links to either documents or previous webinars that again you can use to inform your planning. So there's so much there. Um, as Francesca has already um, stated at the end, uh, tomorrow we will be sending out Mark's slides and some other links to um, other in information as well. Um, you will be sent a survey, please complete the survey because evaluation of impact is really important to us at Whole School Send this year. So if whilst you're following these webinars, you wish to share any further information with us, we'd really appreciate that. So you can do that either by contacting the regional leads or by contacting information at Whole School Send. And we'd love to start a, um, up a, a dialogue with you about your journey. I'm gonna have a quick look at the chat and see if there are any particular questions. We've got lots of questions that we're here to help and s survey links and people requesting further information. So thank you, Mark. I think you've really sparked our thinking today. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for people listening to me. <laughs> Okay, goodbye everyone. I hope you have a good evening and it's been a great start to the week. Thank you all. Bye now.